that he wins online service. We trust that you've had a good week. Today is Mother's Day, a day where we not only celebrate mothers, we celebrate women for who they are and the impact they have upon us. Unfortunately, across society and across the world today, women are still discriminated against, and we call out against this in any form or any matter. They should be honoured, they should be loved, and should be cared, and treated with dignity like anyone else should be. I was reading my Bible this week, and I read about Moses and Pharaoh, and Pharaoh demanded that all children under a certain age should be slaughtered, all the males, because he didn't want the Jewish nation to increase in Egypt. But when Moses was born, he was hidden amongst the reeds in the River Nile. And it's said that Pharaoh's daughter went to bathe in the River Nile and saw Moses in the basket. And we read that Pharaoh's daughter took Moses in at great risk to herself because of her father. And she was happy enough to fight against injustice and looked after Moses and cared for him and brought him up in the household of Pharaoh. That's what one woman who did not actually follow God did and actually then was in the purposes of God. So today is all about you women. And we're going to watch a little video, a clip from uh, the website from Home for Good. Um, and we just uh, want to acknowledge the work that they do. And there's a number of videos there. So you can follow them if you want to Google Home for Good. And we're going to watch a little bit of a video about women in the Bible because it's all about you today. But also we have John Iverson speaking with us today. And he's speaking about being motivated by God's love. And we trust that he would just enjoy listening to God's word. And, and uh, as you listen, God will speak into your situation. Let's just pray. Lord, I just thank you for today. I thank you that for all the women that have impacted our lives, Lord, everywhere. We thank you for the sacrifice, the hard work that they do all the time. But Lord, we just want to honour honor them. We Lord, we want to show them dignity because of who they are, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you use many women in the Bible. You still use many women today, Lord. And Lord, they are equal to men. And we thank you for that equality and the love, Lord, we are able to show them. And the love, Lord, that they show us as mothers, Lord, as the care that they show. But also, they are more than that, Lord. Lord, they are who you want them to be, Father. We just pray today that you might speak into our hearts, Lord. We pray also you might speak through John Iverson today. And as, you, as we listen to his word, his word, may it speak in every situation. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, Sarah. After waiting to have a child for so many years, you must be overjoyed to have Isaac. Today is about you and all those who are still waiting. Happy Mother's Day, midwives of Israel. You risk your own safety to ensure the survival of countless children. Today is about you and all those who care for children and call it work. Happy Mother's Day, daughter of Pharaoh. By welcoming Moses into your family, you showed so much love Today is about you and all foster and adoptive parents. Happy Mother's Day, Naomi. You walked with Ruth as a friend and cared for a child as your own grandchild. Today is about you and all grandmothers and extended family who care for children. Happy Mother's Day, Hannah. You let go of Samuel, even though it hurt you. Today is about you and all those whose children are not living with them right now. Happy Mother's Day, Anna. Life didn't go as you had hoped, yet you found peace and worth in your service to God. Today is about you and all those experiencing heartache at how things have turned out. Happy Mother's Day, Lois and Eunice. Your faith changed Timothy's life. Today is about all those who are playing a part in raising the next generation. Mother's Day is about you, whatever your role might be. One of the staggering facts you find when you read the New Testament is that a movement which began with a handful of Jesus' disciples within 10 years of his death, the good news about him had reached Alexandria and Antioch, the great cities in Africa and Asia. In fact, it had all certainly reached Rome, capital city of the world by this time. You couldn't separate the social from the spiritual in their message of good news. Like their master, these followers of Jesus went about doing good and preaching the good news of the kingdom. You see, there is only one gospel, 
It is of a God who reaches us in our need, rescues us, then builds us into a new society, is concerned with every aspect of our lives in this world and the next, and although this gospel is timeless and changeless, it is always contemporary. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how did these people, who the Apostle Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as not being wise, wealthy, or powerful in this world's eyes? Just ordinary people like you and me. And yet they accomplished what they did. They had no instant means of communication, no gospel TV, no radio channels, no great evangelistic meetings, no gospel magazines, no great financial backing, nor did they seem to have any classes training them in evangelistic techniques. In fact, when they were scattered as a result of persecution, Dr. Luke tells us in the book of Acts that the believers, empowered by the Holy Spirit, who had fled from Jerusalem and went everywhere preaching the good news about Jesus. And preaching the good news about Jesus is good news, isn't it? So what was their secret of success? How did they make such an impact upon their society? What enabled them to persevere when facing such severe persecution? Now, one of those believers whom God used to impact his society was one of the most unlikeliest persons to do so. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was extremely hostile to the person of Jesus, to his message and to his followers. That was until he had a personal encounter with Jesus himself on the Damascus Road. His encounter with Jesus changed him from the inside out, so much so that his life was completely and utterly transformed, as was his motives. Instead of hate, he is now motivated by the love of Christ. Paul begins to share the same passion and burden for people as Jesus did, because when Jesus looked over the crowds, that followed him, he was brokenhearted because he saw them as being confused and aimless, like sheep without a shepherd. You, you sense Paul's love and burden to see these unbelievers come to know and love the grace of God. When writing to, Corinth, to the Corinthians, he says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spare, I do everything to spread the good news and share its blessings. Then he goes on to say, we are Christ's ambassadors and God is urging us to speak to you. We urge you as though Christ himself were pleading with you, be reconciled to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sins so that we could be right with God through Christ. What is Paul's reason for doing this? Why is Paul so passion, passionate and burdened for people to come to know the Lord? Well, he tells us, because there's going to be a day of coming judgment for us all, he says. Knowing this, he says, I work hard to persuade people to be reconciled to God. Now, maybe you're thinking this morning, now that's all right for you, Paul. Uh, but I really love people and I, I want them to connect with God in a meaningful way. But I really struggle with all of this idea of, of sharing the good news. How can I reach out to my friends and neighbours, colleagues, etc., in a meaningful way? In Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, and if you have your Bibles open, it'd be good to look at them, Paul helps us to understand how, out of a heart of love, we can reach out to our world from the inside out. The question is, Paul, how? How can we reach out to our 
world? Well, first of all, by talking to God about people, then talk to people about God. Look at what he says about talking to God about people in verses 2 to 4. Let's read them together, shall we? He says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Now, notice with me what Paul is saying here. He's saying that prayer must always be our first response, not our last response, in seeking to reach the lost. Well, why does he make this a priority? He does so because he realizes how serious and desperate the condition of the ungodly really are. If you're in any doubt about it, read Romans chapter 1. The picture Paul paints there is an ugly one. He says sin has made us hostile to God and his ways, and because of that we are under God's judgment. And that's why our world is as it is today. In chapter 10 of that same book, you sense Paul's love and compassion for the lost. He says, brethren, with all my heart's desire and goodwill, I pray for Israel and I long and pray to God that they might be saved. Say from what, Paul? Say from judgment. You see, we cannot save anyone at all. It is God who saves, yet he has given us the weapon of intercessory prayer to wage warfare against the enemy of us, of the souls of men and women that would seek to keep them in bondage. Do we have a heart of love and compassion to pray for the lost like Paul? Down through the centuries, God has used people like you and me who have had such a love and compassion to pray to him to work in the salvation of of men and women who are lost. That's why when you read your history, you will be encouraged to discover that when the church has been fighting for its very life, that people have begun to pray. And as they prayed, God has moved in sovereign power to save men and women and change society because it's changed people that change people. Here in Wales, when the church was in such a desperate state, God raised up many people like Daniel Rowlands, Howell Harris, William Williams, and more recently Evan Roberts to preach the gospel and to pray for God to break through. And he did. In the 1904 revival here in Wales, that lasted less than a year, 100,000 people were converted. You see, this is how society is transformed, by each person being transformed from the inside out. Then they endeavour to bring their friends and families to be transformed too. So they bring their friends to be transformed too. And so one by one, as that transformation takes place, society is transformed too. In family, in college, in neighbourhoods, society is transformed. You see, this kind of praying demonstrates our love and compassion for the lost and our total dependence upon God to work in the saving of them. Why is prayer to be our first response? Because it is when we pray... Our hearts are stirred and moved. Heaven shakes, strongholds are broken, and power is unleashed to save. Prayer brings us into the presence of God. And it, here, it is here where we discover his plans and purposes for the saving of men and women. This is where the Holy Spirit pours out God's love his boundless love in our hearts 
for lost people. Prayer eliminates our pride and self-sufficiency. It makes us wait. It, it slows us down. It quietens our hearts and, and sharpens our vision, energizes our faith and develops our, our relationship with him. So much so that we not only develop a deep compassion for the lost, but we begin to understand his will and purposes for them. I remember when I was planting a church in London and it was in a, a, an estate that had these high rise buildings and uh, after a number of months there, I'd written down where people lived in their houses, the, their names, their family. And before I went out onto that estate to share the good news about Jesus, I used to spend time in prayer. And what I found was this, that my heart was softened, that I sensed the heart of God for those dear people. And I became much more effective when I had prayed than if I hadn't have prayed. My heart was softened for the, with the love of Jesus for them. So I wasn't going out on that estate like a salesman selling religion, but like the woman of Samaria. I wanted to introduce them to Jesus, the Savior of the world. Now let's look at how Paul encourages us to pray for, for the lost. In verses two to four, he lays out a strategy of how to pray for those who don't know the Lord. Firstly, he says, devote yourself to prayer. In other words, be faithful in prayer. And the first thing is that we need to identify who we are praying for. That's why I've always found it a very good um, policy to write down a list of people who don't know the Lord, who are your friends or family, that you really want to pray for, that you want to see them come to know the Lord. So identify them, then intentionally pray for them constantly and be persistent in prayer when you are praying for them. Now I know that prayer is not easy, is it? Have you found it easy? But you see, we have an enemy that wants to keep us from praying for lost people. That's why Paul says, devote yourself to prayer. Just also as Jesus encourages us to pray and not to lose heart. Why does he say that? Because he knows that very often we do lose heart, don't we? When we're praying for the unbeliever. And why is that? Is it because our prayers don't seem to be answered straight away? Or that the situation seems to get worse? Or that we just become weary and get discouraged when we pray? That's why Jesus encourages us to pray and not to lose heart. When I was planting a church in East London, my constant prayer, especially during unresponsive times, was this. You will reap if you do not faint. That was my mantra. You will reap if you do not faint. And guess what? The more I went onto that estate and sowed those seeds of the gospel, I did reap. And so many come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says, when you're praying, pray constantly. Be diligent in your prayer. Then he says, when you pray, be watchful. Pray with an alert mind. So as you pray to the Lord for those on your prayer list, stop and listen. And ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do for these people on my list? How do you want me to love them, serve them? And as God shows you what to do for those individuals, write it down. And then whenever possible, take action upon it. I remember on one occasion in one of the churches I was pastoring, one of the ladies in our church had become a believer and her mother had really opposed her all through her life and had uh, really caused real difficulty for her. Eventually, this lady's uh, mother was in hospital dying. And uh, this lady, I, her name was Iris, said to me, Pastor John, will you go and visit my mum? Because she's dying and she's really hostile to the things of God. And I wanted to come to know the Lord. 
So I remember being in prayer one early morning. And as I was praying, I felt the Lord say to me, go to the hospital now and tell her, and read to her the 23rd Psalm. So I got up, got on the tube, went out to the hospital. It took me about 40 minutes to get there. When I got to the hospital, standing outside of the hospital was this lady, Iris. She said to me, John, you're too late. My mum's in a coma and she's been in a coma for the last couple of days and she's dying. You're too late. I said, well, I can't be too late because the Lord has told me to come and read to her the 23rd Psalm. So I walked into the hospital ward, went down to where the bed was. The curtains were drawn around and the, the, her sisters were sitting around the bed and there was her mother unconscious in the bed. The girl said to me, it's too late, Pastor John, mum's in a coma. I said, it's not too late. God has sent me here. So I sat down beside her. As I sat down beside her, within a couple of minutes, she opened her eyes and she said, I've had a wonderful dream. What's that dream? Oh, she said, the dream is that I was on a beautiful summer's day and I saw this shepherd and all over the mountainside were these sheep and the shepherd was calling the sheep together and it was so peaceful. Then I began to read to her Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I said to her, are you willing to put your trust in Jesus today? She said, I am because the shepherd is calling me. And there and then she gave her life to the Lord. And within three or four minutes, she'd gone into a coma and the next day she passed away. So Paul is telling us when we're praying for the lost, be watchful. Listen to what God wants you to do when you're pr and how to act towards those who are not believers. And then he says, when you're praying, be thankful. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, when we are thankful... <clears throat> That means we are saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to thank you for the grace and love that you have showed in my life. And Lord, I want to say to you the amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, whereas once I was lost and now I'm found. And now I see I want others to come to know that grace too. I'm passionately praying, Lord, that they will come to experience your grace just as I have come to experience it too. So Paul says, on your, when you're praying for people, pray with that purpose of heart. And then he says, pray for us, that God will give us opportunities to speak about Christ and that the message will be proclaimed clearly. Notice what Paul doesn't request here. He's not asking for prayer for deliverance from prison or to be delivered from the dangers of hardship, but for the advancement of the gospel. For God to open doors and create opportunities to share the good news about Jesus and to be able to share it clearly as possible. You see, what is the purpose of praying? It's praying for those on my list. Praying purposefully like Paul prayed in Romans chapter 10 that those in my family and network might be saved. Praying like Ezekiel encourages us he says, pray that God will take away the heart of stone, the heart of resistance, and give them a heart of flesh to respond to his call. Pray as Peter encourages us to pray for the ungodly. Cause them to be born again to a living hope, Lord. Pray on the basis of Paul's writer to the, uh, letter to the Ephesians when he says, Lord, bring out them from spiritual death into eternal life. Pray on the basis of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, that God would open their eyes and take away their blindness inflicted by the God of this world so that they might see the truth of the gospel. And pray that God would give you opportunities to share your faith, show them how to share your faith and also to share it in a winsome and a clear way. Now that Paul has encouraged us to talk to God about people, now in verses 5 and 6, he shows us how we are to talk to people about God. <clears throat> Look at what he says in verses 5 and 6. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. It's interesting that before Paul talks about our conversation with those who don't believe, 
he talks about the kind of conduct we are to reveal to those who don't believe. So where do we begin? Firstly, he says, be aware. Live wisely among those who don't believe. Do you know that most people come to Christ through friendships? Not great crusades, but actually personal friendships. And the sad fact is this, that many Christians don't have any non-Christian friends. And so if you haven't got any non-Christian friends, how can you lead them to Christ? So here's my question. Who are your non-Christian friends? Who are the people that you have identified on your prayer list that you are praying for? We have to identify those who are on our prayer list and praying for them, particularly to come to know the Lord. Then Paul says we are to be wise. Live wisely among those who are not believers. The way we live before the people who are not Christians, those who are we praying for in our network, it's important that our relationships with them are good and wholesome. Are our lives overflowing with love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Do we demonstrate in our everyday life that quality of integrity and authenticity that people can see as we live our lives? They see Jesus in us. I remember some years ago when I was wit witnessing to a friend of mine, he was a good friend of mine, and I was telling him about the Lord and how he needed to come to know Christ. He said, to, stop. He said, I want to know nothing about your Jesus because one particular person who's a leader in a church actually treated, uh, he actually cheated me in my business. And not only that, the way he treats his wife and family, if that is what it means to be a follower of your Jesus, I want nothing to do with him. Now I know we're not all perfect, are we? You can ask my wife Sandra and she'll tell you I'm not. But as we grow in our Christian life, we should be coming more and more like Jesus, shouldn't we? Not sanctimonious, not a holier than thou, not judgmental or pharisaical, but like Jesus, dealing with people as he wisely dealt with people in his day. Let Jesus love the people through you. Then he says, Paul says, be gracious. As one translation puts it, let your speech at all times be gracious, pleasant and winsome, seasoned as it were with salt. The Apostle Paul makes the same point in one, sorry, the Apostle Peter makes the same point in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says this, and if you are asked about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But you must do this in a gentle and respectful way. Now, as we share this good news, now I know that we're not all evangelists, but we're all witnesses. Witnesses of what Jesus has done in our lives. And we can share that story in a wise and gentle way. So as we are witnesses, we are to do so in a winsome, loving way, not arrogantly, not aggressively, not judgmentally, or with a know-it-all attitude. Remember, we are witnesses of what Jesus has done in our lives, not prosecuting lawyers. No, our speech is to be like our Lord's. Dr. Luke tells us in his gospel that people were amazed at the gracious words that fell from Jesus' lips. You see, you can never minister grace if you have never received grace. Why did Paul add this conversation should be seasoned with salt? Salt used, was used as a preservative as well as a seasoner in Paul's day. So he is saying that our conversation must be pure, clean, making sure that no corrupt communication comes out of our mouth. And so finally, Paul says that we are to be ready let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you may never be at a loss to know how you ought to answer anyone who puts a question to you. Do you know that one of the most powerful ways 
of answering questions that people put to you is to listen to their concerns. And as you listen to their concerns and they tell you about their concerns, you can then begin to tell them about how Jesus has helped you with your concerns and point them to Jesus. So we can change our world from the inside out as we take this encouragement from the Apostle Paul. And let me encourage you today to take on board these simple truths to make a difference where you are. And maybe today you don't even know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, but he's calling you. And he's calling you to follow him. Would you like to follow him now? Tell him, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you and serve you. And begin to take that first step of faith and follow him from today. May God bless you. Amen.